now. There we go. We are now recording, and I'll start sharing my slides. So we should be able to see that. It's kind of funny how, like, right whenever you get to the last little bit of a webcast, the amount of registrations or the attendees just spike. I guess we're all very busy and we have lots of stuff going on. Somebody just put in, we really needed that third marketing email to let us know that we should sign up. Yeah, kudos, kudos, absolutely. All right, let's go ahead and let's kick this thing off. First and foremost, I want to say thanks. I know that you guys have busy days and some of you guys aren't allowed to watch webcasts from work. So some of you guys jump out to your cars and jump on MiFi's or whatever. So I greatly appreciate you guys hanging out for the Sacred Cow Tipping series. Now, the Sacred Cow Tipping Series, I want to give you a heads up as far as where we're going to go with this. The Sacred Cow Tipping Series is going to be... Uh, it's going to be a it's going to be a series starting with antivirus. We're going to move on to firewalls and how to test firewalls, and then we're going to move on to any other project that we can find. And a lot of that's going to be dependent on you. AV is easy for us because we can go out, and we can purchase antivirus, we can get 30 day free trials. That's awesome. However, some of these other technologies, especially when we start looking at things like data loss prevention or we start looking at enterprise level firewalls, we encounter those as part of our network penetration tests. But let's just say it's a bit dicey if we find ways to bypass them to us to actually share them with everybody. And also, we don't have exposure to all the different security products that are out there because many of the security products, we don't even know they're there until many times after the test is completed. So if you have a security product, if you're looking like data loss prevention or a firewall, and you would like to have the Security Weekly team come in and do a quick test on it, and now this is not a pen test, we're not pen testing your firewall, but to do some tests to see what the firewall or the data loss prevention product can or cannot detect, uh, don't hesitate to shoot me an email. I'll put my email up at the end. Um, we will remove all attribution from your organization. We will sanitize slides and screenshots. We will send it to you for approval before we actually incorporate it into the uh, next series in the webcast. We already have a number of them that are set up and ready to go. And the goal of this webcast series is going to be about testing security technologies. How can you test AV? How can you test a firewall? How can you test a data loss prevention product? Because this is so important because we tend to rely on reports and, you know, kind of vendor sh smackdowns by NSS Labs or by Gartner, where they perform magic quadrant surveys of how these products perform. And I'm really coming to the conclusion the vast majority of these, like, like surveyors of different security products are horrible. And we need to do better as a community, as a community. Uh, Robert brought up a question. He says, does this co qualify as continuing education, CEU? Sure, absolutely. Uh, you can put it in for your CISSP, and uh, you can see if they'll give you credit for it. It is a public webcast, and it is going to be archived. So that should work for CPEs or continuing educational units. It should work just fine. However, by and large, we like to say that these webcasts are kind of the anti-CISSP because I can't really think of a time where we talked about anything that was cispish in nature. We might bring up Bella Padula or Clark Wilson models a little bit later, but I really don't think that those have a lot of bearing overall in computer security. All right, so let's get rolling. Uh, this webcast is brought to you by SANS Security 504, a class that I'm very near and dear to. I have recently taken over as the lead course author, uh, course author in conjunction with Ed Scotus. And uh, if you guys are interested in security training, please, please, please do me a favor and check it out. Be very cool. And actually, we probably have a SANS 504 class coming up near you at some point, at some point. So we got lots of projects. Yep, that would be very good. John, if you want to shoot me an email, that'd be awesome. Somebody lost audio. We're back. And somebody said, leave the CISSP alone. Uh, kind of like leave Brittany alone. Also, if you have a link to the I'm a CISSP, CI double SP, uh, please share that with everybody in the uh, chat logs. I think that that would be a great video for people to check out. It'd be awesome. All right, so let's jump in. 
It's also brought to you by Black Hills Information Security. You guys are going to meet the vast majority of Black Hills Information Security uh, because the whole entire team contributed to this entire webcast and uh, want to make sure we give credit where credit is due. And some of them will be presenting on the work that they did. All right, so the agenda, what are we doing today? Now, this webcast, I need to make this abundantly clear at the beginning, is not going to be a webcast that's solely based on AV sucks, AV sucks, AV sucks. Uh, that's not what we're doing here. This is more of an awareness webcast so that we understand the structural limitations for things like antivirus as well. So we're going to be talking about how we need to stop depending on AV uh, for so much security. We got to start looking at it for what it is useful for and have a much better understanding of what it is not useful for. Now, somebody said, what do you mean? AV doesn't suck? Blasphemy. And that gets to my second point. There are some people that say what we're doing here is not cutting edge. And they're right. Um, AV is bypassed every single day. A number of pen testing firms like Trusted Sec, Secure Ideas, and Guardians, Counterhack Challenges. These are companies that do a very good job at what they do for bypassing AV and do it as part of their job. Same as Black Hills Information Security. But what I don't believe a lot of people understand is just how easy it is to bypass antivirus engines. How easy it is for somebody that's a determined targeted attacker to simply change a few small things. Change up the way that the payloads are delivered and bypass them effectively. And that is ultimately one of the main goals of this webcast. So if you have management, if you have people that you work with and they say, well, we don't have to worry about a particular risk vector because we have antivirus and everything is okay, I really, really think that this webcast will be great to show them what it is that we're going to be dealing with when we're dealing with targeted attackers coming against your environment. Well, to that end also, we're gonna talk about why this isn't hard. Because it's not. There's a lot of great tools out there like Veil, vale, like the Social Engineering Toolkit, like PowerSploit. There's a ton of different tools and technologies that exist that make bypassing AV exceedingly easy. And it seems to me that the only people that understand how easy it is to bypass antivirus are the people that do network pen testing and the attackers. And the goal of this webcast is to try to step out and to start trying to share with other people like forensicators and uh, CI double SPs and security essentials people from SANS, people that are in management. We want people to understand that this is in fact a very real risk vector that we have to be very careful of. We're also gonna talk about who we bypassed, which is a lot. And then we're gonna ultimately boil it down to architecture. And yes, we're gonna discuss more cows that need to be tipped as well. All right, so first up, a sacred cow joke. I like to start things out. I was reading a book once on how to perform and do public speaking effectively because you know clearly I don't talk enough for my living. And uh, I, I read in this book, it says, you should always start your presentation with a joke. I'm like, oh, okay, I, I guess I can start that out. Now, um, so just to kind of set the stage, this is about, I would say 15, no, it wouldn't be 15. This is about 10, no, 13 years ago. Good God, it is coming up on 15 years ago. This is about 13 years ago. Uh, my wife and I lived down in Denver, Colorado. At the time, I was working at Northrop Grumman. And uh, my wife worked with a, a really great firm down there doing architectural structural engineering. And trust me, that theme comes back a little bit later in this presentation. And we got into a very interesting conversation about uh, what it is that, you know, what sounds do cows make? And this is just the kind of the, the funny kind of stuff that people talk about when they get together at parties, right? So we're all sitting around and we're joking. And uh, the topic came up about children and, you know, how children like to lean out of the window of a car. And when they lean out of the window of the car, they like to say moo right? So they're driving down the road and the cow says moo and all the kids lean out their window and uh, they all go moo. And we thought that that was really, really cute. And I got to thinking about it. I'm like, well, that's not what my kids do. No, my kids lean out the window and they go because that's the sound cows make on daddy's grill. Now I thought that was very, very witty. Um, I thought that that was kind of funny. But uh, really, I actually offended some people. You see, at the table, we had a couple of people um, who were Hindu, and they were not amused, not amused at all. And it's funny <laughs> because I went on to Google and I tried to find pictures of uh, uh, if, if anybody who's Hindu who looks mad, uh, an angry picture of Gandhi. This is the closest thing I could get of somebody who's a Hindu who, who seems frustrated and angry, but they were not amused. 
uh, they said, you know, we don't think that's funny at all. And I said, why? And they said, well, because we're Hindu and we believe that uh, gods should be, uh, they're, that they're sacred, right? And vegetarians aren't amused either. And so cows are considered gods and they should be, they should be respected and they should be honored. And I got to thinking about this. I'm like, holy crap, I completely offended these people that my wife works with. And then I said, no, 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 it's cool. You see, um, it, it's okay because I'm Catholic and we eat our God every Sunday. And at that point, uh, I remember Sanjeev, the guy that was sitting uh, with, the, with the lady, um, he, he like laughed and spit water all over the entire table at that particular point. And it, it was kind of nice because it was a nice icebreaker. It could have been a horrible, horrible, horrible situation where we got into an angry argument with each other about whether or not we should, we should be eating meat. And, you know, we found a common ground through humor and then we danced uh, afterwards. And I found out that they really liked dancing. And by the way, this is a plug uh, for my friend's studio, the Madra Dance Studio down in Denver, Colorado. If you ever want to see just an amazing show, please check it out. It's kind of kind of a nice group of people that do things. So there is the icebreaker. Okay, so is AV dead? <laughs> sure. Let's assume that for a little while. Let's assume that for probably the next half an hour, that AV is completely and utterly useless. And, and we've mentioned this on the show a number of times. Maybe we should just assume that AV doesn't work at all. Maybe what we really need to do is maybe think about what would happen if we just uninstalled antivirus from our computer systems. Now, there is some value in this thought process. I don't want to start condoning people to start uninstalling AV. But what I do want you to think, think about is what would happen if you did? What would happen to your overall security architecture if we completely and utterly removed AV from all of your computer systems? What would that look like? What would you do? The vast majority of us would, would probably crawl underneath our desks and start sucking our thumbs, right? But the really smart ones in the industry would say, okay, I no longer have antivirus as a defensive mechanism. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start restricting access to the internet for my users. I'm going to start using things like software restriction policies. Maybe I'll try to use application whitelisting as well. And I, I love that because that is ultimately the way we should be thinking. Uh, Deadly Venom brought up a great point. He said, if we got rid of AV, just maybe, just maybe our operating systems and our computers would run better. And I, and I think that that would be a very good point as well. Um, and Kevin brought up, said, I couldn't check that box on due diligence questions other than not much. So, but it's a, it's a mindset game, right? It's a mindset game. If you knew that AV was completely worthless or AV was not installed, what would you do different? It's like those, it's like those the, the things that people say, if you knew you were going to die tomorrow, what would you do different today? And I like to play these type of mental games because it really is the only way that we're going to get better at computer security. And I'll talk about why a little bit later. So yeah, AV catches malware specimens, but it tends to only catch very large ones. And I don't mean large and executable size. I mean, large and widely deployed. So if we have uh, something like smoke loader, right? AV is going to scramble to try to detect smoke loader. If we have something like Zeus, your AV is going to scramble to catch Zeus or crypto locker. And also, I, I think we should have a little bit of understanding about what the AV vendors and the software developers and the signature writers have to go through every single day. I mean, we can beat up on them all the time, but the fact is they're fighting a losing battle. Your AV developer, if you ever see an AV developer, take them out and buy them a beer, please, because they spend all day writing signatures for obfuscated pieces of malware. And it's ultimately a losing battle because it's very easy just to sidestep and come up with new versions of malware on computer systems as well. And Corey brought up a good example, a good point. He said it would save time on pen tests. I, I don't think it would because... Bypassing AV on a pen test doesn't take that long anyway right now. And I, as I said, I think a lot of organizations would do better at trying to secure their networks doing other things if they didn't have it. Now, a little Mia Copa. Uh, as many of you guys know, I, I kind of got started years ago. I did a lot of videos on AV bypass, and I kind of stopped. And there's a couple of reasons why I stopped. The main reason why I stopped is because I honestly felt deep down I wasn't making the security industry better by coming up with ways to bypass antivirus engines. And I needed to find a way that it would be useful to the community if I was going to have this conversation and approach the world 
of, okay, yes, AV can be bypassed. How can we make things better? Rather than making a presentation that is nothing more than a pen tester or a company saying, look at us, we're awesome. Because that's not the goal of this. It really, really isn't. The goal of this is try to affect change. And the only way it starts to change is if we all start equipping ourselves with the tools and techniques so that we can better test and evaluate products like antivirus in our own organization. And as I said, I've been mad about this for a while. And I, probably the peak of my rage was in 2013 when NSS Labs released a, uh, a report about all of the different AV vendors. And they did this, uh, they did this full long report trying to figure out which one was the best one. And I, I was livid when I read this. And, and let me let me explain why. And by the way, this report is done many, many, many times with all kinds of different third parties. This is not unique to NSS Labs at all. We see tons of people that do things like this. And this is basically what their report said. They started out and they said, well, here's the tested vendors. We got AVG, ESET, F-Secure, Kaspersky, McAfee, Microsoft, Norman, Panda, Sofo, Symantec, Trident, Micro. And we're going to do a shootout between all of these AV vendors, and we're going to find out which ones are better at detecting obfuscated attacks, at better at detecting obfuscated payloads and obfuscation techniques that bad guys commonly use in order to deliver malware to a computer system. Now, the way I found out about this report is I got this email from McAfee, uh, from the sales department at McAfee, and it, it basically said, we're number one, we're number one, we're number one. We detected something like 99% of the advanced threats. Look at us. We're awesome. We rock. And, and this first table made my blood boil. It went through and it said, these are the different evasion techniques that they would use. HTTP evasion and compression, HTML obfuscation, payload encoding, executable packers, executable packers to execute, layered evasions overall combined. And it said McAfee detected 100%. And Microsoft System Center detected 100%. Symantec detected 100%. And like I said, I, I saw this and my blood just boiled. And I, and I realized that we needed to do something. And I did a, a quick little video on it and talked about it a little bit, but this is kind of the longer response to reports like this because reports like this are absolute nutter crap. They hurt the overall information security industry because it leads, especially management, into getting into a false sense of security or it leads people to spend money. Like let's say that somebody was running Sophos and they decided, well, we're going to switch over to McAfee because they were better. <sighs> It isn't that McAfee is better than Sophos. They're pretty much the exact same thing um, when we're tra talking about trying to bypass them. A lot of the same types of techniques actually come to play whenever we're dealing with it. So we've got to find ways that we can do testing in this industry and not rely on NSS and not rely on somebody like Gartner to try and tell us what it is that's good and what it is that's bad. You shouldn't trust me. You shouldn't trust Ethan. You shouldn't trust Mick. You shouldn't trust Paul. You should always try to do your own thing to try to do your own testing in your organization. Well, Go ahead, Mick. You not only need to do your own testing, you need to do your own testing to see if your SOC, if your help desk, and other people can see what you're doing. Exactly. Exactly. Good point. And uh, Matt just asked a question. Will a recorded version of this be available? Oh, yeah. There will be. So I thought we could do better. And the reason why I thought we could do better is because we're not a bunch of incompetent clowns. Uh, this is something we do. And I, and I talked about this, this report with a number of other pen testers, from like Dave Kennedy to Kevin Johnson, talked about it with Ed Scotus. And most people have kind of looked at it and laughed and thought, oh, we'll just move on. But I, I, I believe that we as a community need to stand up and basically say, no, we're, we're not going to accept this crap anymore moving forward. So what, what does the AV industry have to say? There's one vendor out of all the vendors that we're going to discuss today that I am starting to have a lot of respect for. And it, it isn't because their product wasn't bypassed. It was. It was absolutely bypassed. But <clears throat> it's because their approach and the way that they look at things is starting to change, at least with their vocalizing as well. At least what they're actually vocalizing um, uh, over, the, over a while. So the best quote ever is, AV is dead. And we can say that. We hear that from pen testers. A lot of you have echoed that in this webcast as well. <clears throat> and here we go. The person that said that was the Senior Vice President for Information Security at Symantec. I, I, I think that that's just 
a beautiful quote. And I, and I think, you know, talking to some people from Symantec lately, a lot of them have been saying things like, we want to move beyond traditional blacklisting AV. We want to start doing the right thing. That's great. I see them starting to implement application whitelisting. McAfee is starting to do that as well. But it's interesting that a lot of these features that these guys are trying to produce are not features that customers are purchasing, are not cust- are features that customers are actually implementing correctly. And that scares me. And we're going to come back to that here in just a little bit. All right, so let's get on with it. So we've created extra slides and videos for each of the AVs and bypass. This is the uh, John Strand does not want to get sued section of the webcast. And I had two way- two choices for not getting sued. Uh, the first The first way to not get sued was to not do this webcast. And trust me, my wife was very much an advocate of doing that. The second way is to basically create full videos and full PowerPoint slides for every single one of the AVs that we bypassed. Okay. Now, the the reason why we do that is for two reasons. One, because you guys have um, you guys have different AV vendors, and there's going to be certain videos and there's going to be certain PowerPoints that are going to be more resonant with you, and you can go and pull those down. We provided them as far as a Dropbox link, so you guys can pull all that stuff down. The other reason why we did the video is because it's a lot harder to argue with the video. Um, we can do a PowerPoint slide and say, we got Meterpreter shell on this system. And AV can come back, or an AV company can come back, and they can try to argue that point. They can say, oh, it's from Photoshop. You guys doctored up the pictures. So I had everybody create a video and a set of PowerPoint slides for each of the AVs that were bypassed. Now, you may wonder, why is John so paranoid about this? Well, years ago, and this would be about three years ago, maybe two, uh, we bypassed McAfee. And sorry, if you work for McAfee, I'm going to pick on them for a little bit. Hopefully, the people that were part of this story are gone. They're unemployed, and they're begging uh, on the side of the street somewhere. But what happened is we bypassed McAfee uh, as part of the labs that we do at SANS' uh, forensics classes. Uh, Mr. Rob Lee wanted us to have realistic labs where AV was in use on the computer systems. They did forensics analysis. And Rob was really shocked that we were able to bypass AV so readily, so quickly, and so easily. So I immediately did a blog post that said, is, is AV dead? So if you do SANS Forensics blog, is AV dead? It's going to take you right to Rob Lee's article on that. And immediately, and we chose McAfee, by the way, as the, as the AV of choice. And we got into a meeting with the McAfee uh, vice presidents about this. And you could tell they were just on the cusp of threatening to sue us. And it was, it was extremely frustrating to me because whenever I went into that meeting with the McAfee executives, I fully expected them to say, how did you do this? What can we do to make our product better? Instead, they said, why did you choose to single out our product versus all the other products? And our answer to that question was, it's used by DOD. It's used by a lot of corporate customers. And uh, they demanded us to retract certain things. And it was really a harsh harsh uh, conversation. They started yelling at each other. It was, it was, just, uh, it was just absolutely frightening um, what they were saying to each other, what they were doing. And it, you know, I was terrified I was going to get, um, I, I was going to get sued by this, by this company at this point. And their number one concern was not how to make their customers more secure. Their number one concern was not how to do better. Their number one concern was keeping market share and mitigating the damage. That's it. That's all that they cared about. And that frustrated me, and that made me very, very angry. And uh, and I hope that that doesn't happen from here. I'm hoping if there's anybody on this webcast that's from AV companies, that the question is asked, how can we do better? How can we work with our customers? How can we give them better tools to do better moving forward? Because don't don't try to silence pen testers. Don't try to silence people that are doing this type of research anymore. Um, and now a question from Aaron was, is this going to be recorded? Absolutely, it is going to be recorded. We will provide that. All right, so these are the AV vendors that we picked out. I know that it's not every single one of them, but does anybody want to take a wild, crazy guess? What total market share of AV do you think we got from this webcast? So we have a vast McAfee, Sofo, Symantec, Kaspersky, Trend Micro, Panda, and AVG. Um, we might be missing some, uh, but I, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, Chris says about 95%. We didn't have Microsoft on here, and I feel bad about not doing that. But uh, Microsoft, I would say, is probably underneath the hood of almost any of the tests that we did with these as well. Will the slides be shared? Absolutely, the slides will be shared. What about WebRoot? What about ESET? Nod. Dude, we had to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> so, so these are the big ones that we decided to go with for this section. And also, I, I'd like to do a shout out to John McAfee. Um, I think uh, I, I, I miss him 
running a major corporation. I, I think that we need to start a petition to get him reinstated as a president and manager of McAfee AV. I think that that would be a good thing um, as well. Matt Norton Symantec would be very similar. So yeah, these are the ones that we decided to pick on. All right, so we're going to start with the vast. Uh, ben Donnelly is on the line. Ben Donnelly has been uh, recently elevated from intern status to full employee of Black Hills Information Security. And he's also known affectionately in Black Hills Information Security as quite possibly the smartest person at Black Hills Information Security. Ben, are you on? Maybe not. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can, dude. I can. John? Yes. Can you hear me, Ben? Yes, sir. All right. So you decided to pick a, a vast, right? Um, now, uh, it's interesting uh, with a vast. I like a vast how it pops up and it says everything is good, um, which which I, which I thought was cute. And they also, I would say out of all the AV vendors, have the cutest logo. Uh, I don't know what the hell that, that little policeman with the mustache is. It's kind of like a hipster lobster uh, police officer. Um, but uh, it says everything is good. And the reason why we picked a vast is because it's a free antivirus. Uh, they have a commercial product as well, and a lot of home users use Avast, right? Absolutely, I, yeah. Avast is, is kind of the de facto standard for free antivirus, as far as I am aware. So, yeah, it's just the one that I see all of the time, uh, everywhere. So that's that's really, really, really important as well. All right, so Avast was actually catching some things, right? Uh, so, that's right. yeah. So what was this? This was a. It said backdoor executable. What type of executable was it? This was just a very simple, uh, non-obfuscated interpreter uh, reverse TCP that I used in order to demonstrate that Avast was in fact, you know, enabled and working properly. Oh, very cool. So, and uh, this is actually a consistent theme that you're going to see across all the AV engines that we talk about. We show that it was catching something. Now, this looks like this looks like my kids sat and typed on my computer for like 15 minutes. What the hell did you do here, Ben? Ah yes, okay. So this this is something that the uh, this is this is how we bypass the AV engine. Basically, this is again, interpreter reverse TCP, except this time it's encoded, and it's uh, it's being launched as a shell code execution via PowerShell, which was wrapped up inside of a, a bat file. So instead of a .exe, simply a bat file, uh, just as easy to run, just as easy to transport, and yeah. And this is actually a theme that we see again and again. I think you were the only one that did the, uh, uh, you were the only one that did it in a, uh, it, like did it in coding and a batch script and all this stuff. But it, it, it managed to actually run fairly well. Uh, you were able to get a reverse session at that point. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that the same type, of, like the interpreter that you had before, and the interpreter that you encoded uh, in Base64 and you put into a batch script and launched via PowerShell? That was the same payload. It was just delivered differently. Correct. That's correct. It's the exact same thing. Yep. So it's just a few little small slights of hands, and then bang, you're now you're now in, and life is good at that point. All right, Ben. Thank you so much. I appreciate yes, you coming and hanging out, sir. And I'm going to pretend to be uh, Brian over this next section. Uh, Brian decided that he wanted to take on AVG. Now we're starting with the main home uh, antivirus that we see all the time, um, because we do see AVG constantly. Um, especially in home computer systems. We don't see it that much, uh, VAST or AVG in the corporate space, but still there's a lot of people that use these two types of, a, uh, of AV. And once again, it's got a nice little thing that says you're now protected, fully patched AVG antivirus software. Everything's up to date. And once again, the care file or the kind of proof that this was actually working is we tried again to do a very simple HTTPS reverse interpreter session. And he actually threw in a couple of different things. He did a little bit of backdoor executable encoding and some UPX packing, and both were easily detected. And, and it's interesting, as a pen tester, and you know, having done this a lot, uh, at BHIS, we've learned that UPX years ago, a setting of two or eight, worked really, really good for bypassing AV engines for years. Up until recently, now antivirus engines tend to do a lot better at detecting things that are packed with packers like UPX. You can still have a lot of luck if you use a commercial packer. If you're going to use something like Thamida, uh, which is a commercial packer for executables, that still tends to bypass quite a few AV engines because you have to pay money for it. It is a quote-unquote legitimate project. But for this, we wanted to keep it simple. UPX packing, AVG was having none of it in that situation. So Brian uh, is another very, very, very smart dude. And Brian basically uh, <laughs> uh, decided to whip out C-sharp. 
So he fires up C Sharp and he pulls up Visual Studio 2010 Express and he creates a brand new executable. And most of the code is there on the screen. So if you guys want to download Visual Studio and you want to create your own executable, you too can do this. Now, what is he doing in this little bit of C code? Well, if we look closely, he's creating a new executable. But if you look at the string command, you can see that big red line across the inside of it. It says string command function invoke shell code and then a whole bunch of different PowerShell commands to invoke shell code and run PowerShell uh, to pull down and run the malware itself, to pull down and run the malware itself. So it, 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 it's actually very, very cool because he's creating a new executable that is yet again invoking PowerShell. PowerShell is going to be a reoccurring theme for a lot of these, a lot of these different techniques. And the reason why we're using PowerShell so heavily is one, because it flat out rocks. And two, the other reason why we're using PowerShell is because it's built in and it's like having a full Python or a Ruby, a full interpreted environment at your fingertips, which gives you tremendous power. And the final reason is a lot of AV engines aren't going to start flagging on PowerShell and saying, ah, we're going to stop this little PowerShell thing from executing. It's just not going to work. So basically fired up the full PowerSploit script put it into a function call within a new executable, and then compiled the executable and opened it up and the session was started again. Now, um, a couple quick notes on this one that I think are important to understand. Most AV engines cannot detect obfuscation techniques of Metasploit. Now, I know that there's some people here from AV companies that are completely flipping their crap right now, and they're saying, absolutely, we can detect those types of obfuscation. Well, hold on for just a couple of moments. By and large, they cannot actually detect the malware within an executable. What they're detecting is they're detecting the wrapper that's around it. They're detecting the template.exe, or they're, dete they're detecting what is happening within the executable itself whenever you insert the malware into the executable. Barring that, a lot of antivirus engines are not detecting it on what we call the first stage. So the first stage would be the initial executable that reaches back and it pulls the rest of the malware down. So let's just kind of, you know, talk about this from stagers and stages for just a second. Metasploit has a stager and a stage, okay? So the stager is going to be the first thing and it's going to pull it back and it's going to pull the stage, which is the rest of the malware. Now, this is going to become important when we get to Joff's section. A lot of times the initial executable that is reaching back and pulling the, the malware is not detected because that's relatively easy to obfuscate. A lot of AV engines now are detecting the second stage, and that's the actual malware that is going to be injected into memory. And we'll talk about that more here in just a few moments when we get to Joff's section of today's class. i uh, got a couple questions I want to clear up here real quick. Um, we had a question. I would love to see how Zone Alarm Extreme Security stands against. Um, it's from Checkpoint. It must be good. I think that that's a joke. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but no, it would, it would fare about the same. Um, almost, And that's kind of one of the points. If you're thinking, would WebRoot work better? Would Zone Alarm work better? You're thinking about it the wrong way. That's not the goal of this webcast to say that these AV engines are crap. We picked a whole bunch of AV engines because we had to bound it at some point. We couldn't do all of them because that would be insane. But yes, the same types of techniques that we, you see here will work on them as well. It is very, very important to understand that any AV engine can, in fact, be bypassed. That is not, that's the goal of this webcast. It's not that your AV is better because we didn't pick on it. It's just please understand that they can be bypassed. When I use PowerShell, I took care of which PowerShell version is in installed on the target server, so I can just use commandlets to support it in a specific version. That's interesting, um, mainly because we have a, a PowerShell script that is being worked on by one of our interns and Ethan. Um, Ethan, if you're on, if you want to talk about the uh, PowerShell script that you're working on with Luke and some of the problems that you've had specifically in the area of using the right version of, uh, of a Windows system when you're creating your PowerShell script and testing it. Uh, that would be cool. Okay, so, yeah, can you hear me all right? Yep, absolutely, coming through strong. All right, so it's a PowerShell script that essentially does a technique called password spraying. Uh, do you want me to go through what password spraying is? Or yeah, just absolutely, I think, I think we should talk about that really quick, too. All right, so it's similar to like, brute forcing, pa password brute forcing, but instead of picking a user and you have a, a list of, like, a million passwords to try against that user... Um, in a corporate environment, you'd very quickly lock out 
their account because most corporate environments have the lockout set to three, five, eight, way less than a million. <laughs> so password spraying, how that works is you, you get a list of all the users in a corporate environment or it works for um, web applications or any, any, any place where there's a lot of users and a lockout policy. You get a list of users and then you try one or two or three passwords, very few passwords that's underneath the lockout policy and you try them for each successive user in turn. So essentially you're spraying a password across all of the users to avoid locking out any one account. And that way you can try very weak passwords and chances are you're going to get some user that's using a weak password. Uh, anyway, so we're, we're writing a password spraying script in PowerShell and it was working great and I tried it, then I tried it on Windows 7 and it completely failed. And the reason being, uh, the, the function call that Luke uh, chose was specific to PowerShell version 4, which is only available on Windows 8 and 2012. So that, that was the issue we ran into, and we had to pick another, um, we had to find another suitable replacement for that function in order to do the authentication. Cool. And, and I think that that, that, that kind of reinforces that guy's point. It's basically, sometimes you got to set things up for the target environment, right? All right. So thanks, Ethan. Um, had another question from Bob. He said, do you need to be root or admin to run these executables? No, you don't. Uh, by and large, you do not need to be root or admin to run these as well. Uh, another question from John said, how long did this take us to do? Uh, I would say that the majority of these were done last night. Um, the majority of these techniques were done at the very last minute. Um, and for example, Mick Douglas's I got like this morning. Uh, Mick, do you want to talk a little bit about Kaspersky? Because yours has been doing a lot of, uh, you've been doing a lot of work in this realm, talking about PowerShell. And also, sure. um, Ian has a question, and uh, I'll, I'll answer it very quickly before you jump on. He said, can you talk about PowerShell execution policy? Like, usually it's set to restricted. And most executables that you drop on a computer system can automatically flip it over to set execution policy unrestricted and then move on in their merry way. So, Mick, if we flip it over to setting the execution policy to unrestricted, what is the worst thing that can happen? Take it away. Well, so the worst thing that can happen is what we're about to show you. And what I did for my particular AV was I was tasked with Kaspersky. And here you see a view of Kaspersky up to date and working. And then go to the next slide, please, John. And uh oh. A mic just went muted. <laughs> there you go. You're unmuted now, oh, sir. Okay. There you go. There you go. I was afraid we lost you. Um, so now you'll see that the various bits of malware that we created were actually caught, so the system is working as expected. We actually did uh, some interesting trickeration using a social engineering toolkit and did a backdoor encoded executable where we forced the template into the um, executed, executed component and encoded it four times. So it was actually a pretty what used to be a fairly tough thing for antivirus, and it's now caught routinely. But now, when we went to just browse and pull it down using a web browser, it gets caught. And uh, this one in particular is uh, an MSF Venom that we used the Shikataganai encoder, ran it through like six different times. So, you know, antivirus game uh, definitely has stepped up, so what we decided to do was just play a different game. So what we we're dropping, one of the tools that we're dropping in this webcast is PowerCat, which is a Netcat implementation entirely in MS PowerShell version 2. The reason we chose MS PowerShell version 2 is because it should work across all existing versions of PowerShell. So Windows 7, and Windows Server 2008 and above, it should work. We're still testing everything out. It's very early beta. But right now, what it supports is listener mode and client mode, so it works like a standard uh, uh, netcat. And so if you go ahead, I'll show you how you set it up. 
on your Windows system, you will go ahead and execute the power cat command, specify which port to listen on, and then what executable to run when somebody connects into your system. And in this case, we're going to send them a good old-fashioned DOS prompt back, a cmd.exe. Now, again, it it's, bears uh, repeating that you do need to have the execution policy set to unrestricted. However, as John mentioned, that's not that difficult to get around. And there's also techniques for um, making a um, PowerShell script into one just gargantuan long one-liner mm -hmm. that will work. So um, this isn't that high of a hurdle to cross. That's one thing that we want to point out. And then what you see below that is on a Cali system, we're actually invoking a netcat call into that system. And then next slide, please. You'll see that we can simply type a command. We're not presented with the C you know, prompt that you're used to. This is a shell, so it's slightly limited in how it looks. But you can see we go ahead and type path, and it will export the path and show us what we've got. You can uh, have normal commands like echo percent computer name, and you'll get that. Um, if you want to enter um, any command, as long as it's a one-liner, will work in this version of Power of PowerCat. So, cool. and it's still beta. Fun. It's still a work oh, in progress, right? It, it was beta. all the way. Yeah, yeah. So we're just we're going to be releasing it. So I know some of you are like, "Where the hell can I get it?" There you go. Uh, PowerCat is something that you can download. And uh, please do me a favor. And this is something I say in a lot of our webcasts. Mick's doing this out of the kindness of his own heart. If PowerCat doesn't do something that you that you want it to do, don't flame Mick. Uh, don't get angry at people who do free things uh, because that's just not cool. That's not very neighborly at all. Um, what we would right. recommend is give suggestions, give improvements, help us make the project better because that's the way to do things correctly. Yeah, fair point. And if you uh, actually go and download this and look at the code, you'll see that this software is free and always will be free. And if it doesn't work for you, I'm happy to give you a full refund. <laughs> you always get what you pay for. Pay for. Thank you, Mick. And please download and play with PowerCat. I think it's really, really cool. Now, a couple of quick questions that have came up. Hey, John. Uh, yeah, Ben, is that you? I just, I just want to add something really. Yeah, this is me. Uh, real, real fast on the on the PowerShell restriction policy. When I executed mine, uh, PowerShell was entirely restricted, but it was. It was one of those gigantic one-liners, so you don't even have to necessarily change that. I just want to make sure uh, it's out and, there. And that's a good point uh, Mick didn't touch on. Uh, PowerCat can actually be ran as one massive one-liner. Um, it doesn't have to be a full program that you download as well. So thanks for reminding us on that, Ben. Um, so we had a question, though. A uh, question was, mainly PowerShell isn't used for privilege escalation, and that's an absolutely uh, correct point. Uh, PowerShell is not really generally used for privilege escalation. That's why Ethan's tool that he's working on with Luke for doing password spraying with PowerShell is so important. So usually the way this works is whenever we get access to a computer system, we do not have privileged use. That means we're not administrator, we're not system, we're not root. However, when we're looking on Windows computer systems, it is very easy to still use PowerShell to then pull back and pull in our malware and do all kinds of evil things on the computer system as well. Now, for escalation, if your system has a local privilege escalation vulnerability, you can take advantage of that. You can also take advantage of overall architecture failings, like group policy preference files, and you can then find clear text user IDs and passwords by accessing the sysvol share on a domain controller or Ethan's tool. You can use password spraying to try to guess what a password is as well. So that's very, very, very important as well. Someone said, seems like we need to blacklist PowerShell. Good luck with that. All right, now I'm going to hand it over to Bo, who did Trend Micro. Bo, are you on? Hey, how's it going, John? Hey. All right, so with uh, Trend Micro, um, I installed the, or actually this is this is Mac cookie, it looks like. Got oh, sorry. That's what I get when I copy and paste things. So <laughs> McAfee. Sorry, you did McAfee. Right. So, you do Trend uh, Micro. Trend Micro I, comes later because it's in the yep. T's. <laughs> so, all right. So with McAfee, uh, you know, I installed the latest version on a Windows, uh, Windows 7 box, fully patched. And we can move on to the next slide. Um, we'll throw one back. Oops. Hold on. Bump, bump. There we go. So I started by uh, just generating a, a interpreter payload that was encoded with Shikata and I. That was caught by McAfee. I used Veil Evasion. 
Uh, that was also caught by McAfee. Um, but using PowerShell, uh, if you move on one more slide, please. Using PowerShell to uh, download PowerSploit and invoke the uh, interpreter payload into memory. Uh, it completely bypasses McAfee and got the reverse connection. Very cool. Thank you so much. And you're going to be back again here in just a couple of seconds. Now, yes, um, what's interesting is you talked about direct memory injection. Um, so that's basically where the, the stager itself isn't touching the disk. It's actually going directly into memory, right? Exactly. And, and one of the things that we've learned from this little exercise is that a lot of AV engines are really poor at dealing with direct memory injection attacks for malware being injected as well. All right, and Brian is not on still, which is fine, because he's working, and he decided to play with Panda. Um, why did he pick on Panda? I almost feel bad, guys, like, you know, playing on the free AV vendors, because I mean, they're free. You know, we talk about you get what you pay for. I said, don't yell at Mick, and I know that now people are going to yell at AV vendors like Avast and Panda, but he decided to try Panda antivirus as well, and I think the reason why he chose is because a family member was using it, and this actually is something that comes up quite a bit. I see family members of mine that are involved in computer security. They're constantly changing. Like, well, I was using AVG and God dang it, I got a whole bunch of Valor on my computer system and I switched over to Panda. Well, it doesn't matter, once again, what AV you're using. If you're spending all of your time downloading and surfing weird, twisted clown porn, you're probably going to get compromised. It doesn't really matter much at all what AV that you're using as well. So once again, the tool was working because standard backdoor executable was working and backdoor with some encoding and some UPX packing was getting detected. However, um, once again, he used the exact same code uh, because, hey, if it worked on one, why not use it for both? And it also bypassed Panda as well. So he used the same executable twice and got access. So that's pretty cool. Um, before we get to Ethan, I want to clean out some of the, uh, some of the questions that we have. Um, JD asked, are you testing AV signatures, scanning one file, or the suite running? Now, this is going to become a very important question whenever uh, Ethan is talking about Sophos. A lot of the suites that we deal with, whenever you install them, especially for home users, they have an egress firewall. So anytime something runs, it's going to do a little pop-up. It's going to say, do you want to allow this executable out? Now, usually what you do is you just rename the executable to something like Internet Explorer or super awesome porn accelerator.exe, and they will click yes. By and large, in most corporate and government environments, their egress firewall on their AV suite is not enabled. Not in all situations, but quite a bit. And Ethan will talk about that here in just a second. We have another question from Ray. I'm the boss. I use PowerShell too, but I've seen how powerful it is. And I can, only, I can use it to manage systems. That's right. So the question is, is the right question how to harden PowerShell? That's part of the right question to ask as well. Tell me one AV that you can trust, none of them. And we'll talk more about architecture a little bit later. It's not about finding that silver bullet AV. Uh, Elaine said, what's wrong with twisted clown porn? Nothing, nothing's wrong. The only thing that's wrong with twisted clown porn is the fact that there's clowns in it as well. Uh, firewall feature was on and we got some answers here. Holy crap. Um, does AV participate in Ask Grabby Grabby? And if they do, do they prefer to go first or second? Always second. Always second. Because AV is purely reactive as well. Oh, my gosh. Do, do, do. Would System Explorer show these processes running? Yes, it would be. Uh, Ethan, I'm going to hand this over to you so I can clean up some of the uh, questions that we have because we have a lot of questions. So, Ethan, tell us a little bit about Sophos, sir. That sounds good. All right, so I started with Sophos, and um, let's see. You can see in the screenshot, firewall is actually enabled, but I did the testing multiple times, um, once with firewall, the firewall enabled and once with it disabled. And I think what you're going to see in the rest of the slides are it with, with it disabled. Um, so as you can see, it was updated. I did the testing last night, as John pointed out, <laughs> and then... Can we go to the next slide? All right, so tried it with a, a few different executables, uh, similar to what we've seen already. Um, did a, a plain old netcat executable and then packed it with, with say, UPX. And Sophos was able to detect that right away as soon as it touched the disk. 
Uh, and then here's another one um, that's uh, executable uh, that runs Meterpreter. And, oh, I wasn't done with the last slide. <laughs> there you go. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, executable that runs Meterpreter uh, using multiple encoders. And, again, Sophos caught that right away. All right. Now I'm ready for the next slide. So here's something similar to what Ben did uh, using a batch script that runs a PowerShell command with embedded shellcode. And like, like Ben said, um, instead of an executable, we're just using a batch script. And I would argue it's even easier to get a batch script by, say, like um, email filters, because I know a lot of email filters will block um, ex executables by default but not necessarily batch, batch files. But when you download them, you still just double click and it, it runs it. So that's what you can see here. Uh, you've got a, a pop-up window and it shows the, the PowerShell script that ran and then the interpreter session that we got connected back. And this was reverse TCP. I think that's it. Yeah. All right. Very cool. Thank you very much, Ethan. I appreciate it. I uh, had a couple quick questions. Um, in Metasploit, there's another encoder called Shikata Ganai to bypass AV. Um, Shikata Ganai is interesting. It stands, it's Japanese for there's nothing that can be done about it and or nothing can be done. And it, it's a great encoder for the executable, but a lot of times AV, is detect, or AV detects the wrapping executable as well. Uh, Deadly Venom asked about PowerShell. There's a great class called PowerShell for Penetration Testers. So just do a Google on that, PowerShell for Penetration Testers. It'll be a great one to check out. Um, digital code signing certificates for executables, very easy. With PowerShell, you can spend about $190 and you can go online and you can pay for a digital code signing certificate from organizations like GoDaddy or Register.com. And then you can just basically sign your code with a valid certificate as well. Uh, do, 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 do you see the industry raising the bar with all these advanced protection products? No. FireEye and Mandiant. FireEye, I think, is good, but there's ways around that, too, which we'll get to on a later webcast as well. Are you guys getting around execution policy? Now, whenever you have the execution policy, there's, there's a number of them. You can have remote signed. You can have unrestricted and restricted. But yeah, if yours are set to remote signed, we'd have to go with the digital code signing certificate as well. You would have to do that. Oh my gosh, lots and lots and lots of questions. Um, all right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to continue on and I, uh, I, I, I'm going to talk about the stuff and we'll come back to the questions and we'll just hang out afterwards and, uh, and we will uh, we'll try to get as many of the questions answered as possible. All right, so AV bypass and Microsoft Office macros. Now, this is interesting because a lot of uh, our customers, whenever we're trying to spearfish them, it doesn't make much sense to send them an executable. It's not going make to make it there as an executable. Now, you can take almost any payload and you can insert it into a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet as a macro. Now, most of your organizations have disabled macros, and that's a very true point, and it's very fair. However, a lot of organizations have specific people within the organization who have macros enabled. People like financing, accounts payable, accounts receivable, uh, research and development. Many times systems administrators also have macros enabled specifically for things like Excel spreadsheets. So when we're talking about macros, it's very easy to insert an evil malicious macro into a computer system as an Excel spreadsheet, which is very, very cool. And this is how Joff got around Symantec as well. This is how Joff got around Symantec. So he kind of took a different approach. We've been talking about PowerShell. We're still going to see PowerShell in the macros. We've been talking a lot about you know, how to create bat files and all kinds of cool things. But he's going to talk a little bit about the history of macro malware because I'm guess I'm pretending to be him because he's not here. Um, in Metasploit version 4.2.0, uh, they actually incorporated the capability of injecting the malware directly into memory. So it doesn't touch the disk directly. Uh, so it doesn't touch the disk directly. Now you can use visual basic routines like virtual allocation, where you can basically dump the malware and the hex right into memory and then execute it from there. The reason why this works is because it's not touching the disk. And a lot of AV engines, they have to look in specific places for malware to exist and run on a computer system. And the disk 
reads and writes seems to be a very logical place to actually watch for malware to hit the system. However, if we don't touch the hard drive, it makes it harder to detect. So in research, we've seen virtual ALEC actually detected in some situations. Uh, so you'll have some AV engines, whenever you have a macro that invokes virtual ALEC or virtual allocation, they will stop that macro from running. Or they'll actually jump in and start looking at it. Somebody was bringing up, uh, Sven brought up heuristics as well, and it will stop it from Firing up. Now, however, there's a slight problem with this. Okay, there's a slight problem with this as it stands. And the problem with it as it stands is if we can obfuscate how these things are called, it makes it harder for AV engines to actually detect them. It also brings up another interesting question that stage, that second stage that's coming in. So we can have the macro inside the Word document, but what most people don't understand is that macro itself is not the full malware in many situations. Then in Metasploit parlance, there's things called singles, which are very, very small backdoors that can be loaded up in a standard Excel spreadsheet as a macro. However, by and large, most of the time, that single stager is going to reach back and pull a second stage. Now, in Symantec's testing that uh, that uh, Joff did, he found out that Symantec was actually catching that second stage. So if you actually tried to run it, you did a reverse TCP payload, Symantec would jump up and say, hey, we blocked this. It's Meterpreter reverse TCP. So how do we get around that? Well, this is where having an understanding of separation between the stagers and the stage is so important. Because if we understand that the stage is going to come from the attacker's computer system, it's going to be pulled by the stager and then inserted into memory, we can change the way that stager, that second stage, looks. We can change the way that that actually runs. So in Metasploit, there's a really cool technique where you can use simple x86 countdown encoding on the second stage. Here's the way it looks. So what happens, you set up your reverse listener, right? We've got the payload, we've got the L host, that's basically just gonna be listening. The L port is 443. And then we can do stage encoder to x86 countdown. Now this is specifically encoding that second stage that's going to hit the computer system. Because a lot of the AV companies are getting very, very good at detecting that initial stage or that first stage that's going to be dropped on the computer computer system, and they're not so hot at detecting the second. The first stage we can encode, we can scramble, we can do all kinds of fun things to, but many times the stager, the, or excuse me, the second stage is pretty vanilla. So McAfee was very, excuse me, Symantec was very good at detecting that. So simply putting in his stage encoder to x86 countdown, he was able to get it to run and bypass. Now there's other ways that you can do macros. Rather than trying to use your standard Metasploit and payloads using things like stagers and stages, you can once again invoke PowerShell directly from your Visual Basic Script macro. So you can say ps command powershell.exe, execution bypass, command iex, we're starting up a new kind of internet explorer browser instance, new object system net web client, we're starting up a web client, we're downloading from the PowerSploit project, invoke shellcode, payload windows from interpreter, reverse HTTPS, set the L host, set the L port, and you're off and running. So that's very, very cool. And Joff regretfully couldn't be here today, which is kind of a bummer. Now, finally, Bo, I got it right. I finally got it where it has your name and the right yeah. AV engine uh, for, for bypassing. Right. So you took Trend, on, Trend Micro on as well. So take it away, sir. Yes, sir. So uh, Trend Micro. Uh, brand new install on a uh, Windows 7 box, uh, fully up to date, patched, and you can move on to the next slide. So with Trend, I generated a very vanilla interpreter reverse TCP payload that uh, was completely unencoded. Uh, so I, I used no Shikataganai encoding, uh, no PowerShell to inject into memory, and just ran it as a uh, hard binary on the system itself and got my shell. Um, <clears throat> I was a little curious just to make sure that, you know, it was actually detecting malware at all, so I, I uploaded this binary to VirusTotal and 33 of the other 54 whatever vendors that are on VirusTotal detected it as malware, but uh, Trend was one of them that does not. So that was, that was a pretty easy one to bypass. Inter interesting, and, and I think, wasn't this the first one you did was Trend? 
Yep, it was. And and and, and I remember you, you you kind of contacted some of the testers, and you're like, "Is this working?" Um, so, yeah, some of the AV vendors they just don't seem to detect much of anything at at all, which is a bit frightening, I guess. So, all right. So now a lot of you guys, I uh, got a couple more questions. Hans has asked, "Is how is the Bat PowerShell rights being disabled? If you're a normal user with PowerShell, is normally not running scripts that are not trusted. In other words, how is it run as administrator? It, it's not. In in these situations, you can invoke and you can run PowerShell scripts as a standard user, and then you would escalate from that point as well. Um, advanced uh, mitigation uh, toolkit, emit. Will it, what's that? Go ahead. The, the command for running PowerShell like that is you start PowerShell.exe dash execution policy bypass. And it looks like this right here. You see this this command right here for PowerShell? It says PowerShell.exe, exactly what was just said. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, emit, guys, they brought up emit. And it's interesting, emit is, is generally used for stopping things like buffer overflows. If people are downloading and running executables, this will not stop because these are not, these are not exploits, okay? What we're running here are not full exploits on computer systems, but rather it's malware that is being executed. Now these can be coupled with exploits as well. If you really want to shut them down, if you really want to shut down a lot of these attacks, we'd recommend that you look into software restriction policies and application whitelisting as well. So good, good point, good question. All right, so shoulders to stand on or how to build your own lab. Here's what I want all of you to do, okay? I, I want you guys to go out. I want you guys to get Veil. I want you guys to get Social Engineering Toolkit. I want you guys to get PowerSploit. I want you guys to look at the Mark Baggett article on how to use Python uh, to create Python and executables. Uh, this is something that Mark Baggett wrote about a long time ago. It's since been incorporated into the Social Engineering Toolkit. And anytime, anytime you're looking at a security vendor, or you're looking at a security product, I want you to just start creating malware. Just create tons of malware and start running it through these AV vendors. And, and the reason why is we desperately need them to start upping their game. Now, I'm going to tell you how this is going to play out. What's going to happen is the AV vendors will start detecting the very specific executables that Veil creates. Uh, AV is going to start trying to detect the very specific executables that are created by the social engineering toolkit. They are absolutely going to start doing that. However, what you're going to find out is that's only going to work for so long because the people behind Veil, the people behind the social engineering toolkit, the people behind Sploit, uh, PowerSploit are going to find ways that they can change things slightly. Knowing what's happening underneath the hood is very, very, very important in order for bypassing AV engines. And I'm hoping if we hit this with enough companies, if we hit this in a situation where it actually starts impacting their pocketbook, that they're going to start doing better at detecting these types of attacks. I hope. I, I, I do strongly believe that I'm wrong. And, I, and I'll explain why I'm wrong here on the next slide. But this is what you guys need to do to start testing this stuff on your own. I, 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 you know, I love the guys at Offensive, offensive uh, Computing. And they, you know, the, their, their motto is try harder, try harder. I would couple that with something else. Here, let me help you. I, I believe that there's a combination of needing to show people and help people get people pointed in the right direction and also trying harder that needs to be struck in this industry right now. So this is our way of saying, here, let me help you. All of these tools have step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this. This is what you guys need to do. This is what we all need to do. This can't just be a pen testing thing moving forward. Now, the other thing that we do is we try to be more scientific about our pen testing when we're testing things like malware. Rather than having a pen test firm come in and simply say, ha, we bypassed your AV engines, have them be scientific about it. Have them break things down and say specifically, where is our AV detecting and where is our AV failing? This is what we need to do. It needs to be like a checklist going through and testing all of these things. Now, this is a different type of pen test, right? Um, you have a pen test to see if you can get exploited. This is the reverse of a pen test. This is seeing, can your organization detect what happens next? what happens after the, the exploit as well. So what does this all mean? Does this mean that AV is dead and the vendors are all dumb? Not so fast. So before we start ripping on AV vendors, I, I really wanna get this out there as quickly as possible. Look, the reason why their products are the way their products are is because those are the products we're looking for. Those are the products we pay for. 
The reason why their products are so generic at detecting so many different types of malware is because whenever they start getting specific, they start breaking things in environments and organizations absolutely can't have that. You need to understand that most of the AV vendors are implementing standard blacklisting technology because that's what we are buying. Symantec has application whitelisting. McAfee has application whitelisting. Really, almost all these vendors have the capability of moving into an application whitelisting mode. People don't turn it on. And the reason why they don't turn it on is because it's hard work, because it takes a tremendous amount of time to start enabling them. So I would love to sit here and tell you it's all about the AV vendors and they're all stupid and they're all incompetent. But the fact of the matter is they are selling what we are buying. And they also, in many situations, are handing out tools and things that we can use to make things better. Okay? Application whitelisting is very hard. There's no question. And the other point is, if we continue to stay on things like blacklisted antivirus, really targeted attackers are going to continue to bypass it. Look, the, the main thing that you should take is we, at Black Hills Information Security, we divvied up a whole bunch of AV engines, and we were able to bypass them over the course of about 48 hours, many times at night while drinking beer in San Francisco. And I don't want you to take from this that this is uh, that we're all uber elite geniuses, because that's not my goal. Even though I think, you know, Ethan, Ben, Joff, Brian, Bo, uh, Mick, I, I think that these guys are all incredibly, incredibly wicked, frighteningly smart. The fact is your adversaries have far more money than Black Hills Information Security does. They also have far more people than we have at Security Weekly and Black Hills Information Security. So please understand that our adversaries are doing this and they will blow through your antivirus engines because of what's down in caps, because they can buy the same AV and test it before attacking you. And there's a whole bunch of different buzz phrases that pop up. My latest favorite buzz phrase is kill chain. If we can look at what an attacker does and we can break their kill chain, we're going to stop them. It's a load of crap. I hate to tell you that it is. It's just more marketing buzz phrases. And if you think that kill chains and just trying to break off part of what the attackers are going to do are going to stop advanced attackers, that's insane. Every single pen test is different for BHIS. Every single one is unique and special in its own special snowflake way. A good attacker is going to find ways to get around the different security implementations that you put in. So that requires us to develop architectures. Okay. Uh, my wife is a structural engineer. And she's way smarter than I am. I, I seem to surround my people or surround myself with people who, who are way smarter than I am. But she's a structural engineer. And I, I sometimes try to read her books to pretend I'm smart. Um, but <laughs> I've noticed that in architecture and structural engineering, everything about architecture and structural engineering is about failures. And my wife hates it when I say that, but it is. Every single component, every single part of your house, every single component of the building that you're in, the engineers knew the failure points for every single truss, for every single beam, even down to the drywall and the doors. They know exactly at what weight, what deflection things are going to break. Good architecture is the study of how things break and then implementing architectures that compensate each other. Different components compensate each other. Okay, so whenever we're looking at security technologies, a lot of you guys ask the same question again and again and again and again. What AV do we recommend? It's not about finding the right AV. It's about trying to implement your architecture in such a way that any component that is compromised doesn't lead to a catastrophic collapse of the entire structure. So really, if you're looking at what we just did here with AV, we showed you the structural weakness for AV. It is up to us to architect our environment so that that failure doesn't lead to a catastrophic collapse. An example, Mick was working on a pen test early this week and uh, was able to bypass uh, Symantec, I think was the AV, relatively easily. But as soon as the reverse connection started coming out, they had solid egress filtering. They had full interception of SSL. They had full interception of HTTP, standard port 80 traffic, and they were using internet whitelisting. So we had to come up with creative ways to bypass that. So that's what's so important to understand is that that architecture is important. AV may fail, but what happens next? That is ultimately what we start have to start asking. More cows to tip. Firewalls, data loss prevention, threat intelligence. Do you have a product lab or something you want us to help test? If you're in a product shootout, we would love to come in and help. 
what we would do is we'd come in and help. We would take a look at the product. We can't spend like three weeks and give a full report, but we'd come in and we would look at the product. We'd find ways to bypass it, and then it can contribute to the sacred cow tipping. AV is easy because it's cheap. Um, some of these other products are a lot more expensive, and a lot of our customers are not too terribly keen on us going public with bypass techniques. So the follow-ons are probably going to cover, instead of specific products, we're probably going to talk about specific methodologies for testing things like firewalls testing egress filtering, and testing things like data loss prevention, because that's important. All right, so I asked you guys a question. I asked you guys a question um, as part of registering for this class. Uh, it was basically, should Black Hills Information Security get a sales team and start calling people? Now, there are very few times in history that have been recorded where an election has happened and the election was overwhelmingly in favor of one candidate or ideology or another. Most all of them were rigged and completely faked. Of course, we got Muammar Gaddafi, we got Saddam Hussein, we got Mao Zedong, Kim Jong-il. Um, almost all of these guys have elections or had elections while they were alive. And they almost always won with 99% of the vote. Well, we did an election and it was interesting because I, I, if you ask anybody anything, like is water wet? Um, you almost always get this huge variance in answers. We get like 25 different answers. Water is wet, yes. Or water is not wet. It's our experience of the water that makes us think that it's wet. And it's hard to get everybody to agree on anything. It was interesting. But if I said, hey, BHIS, we're going to get a sales team. We're going to start dialing for dollars. Um, you all collectively lost your minds whenever we mentioned that Security Weekly would get a sales team. And you lost your minds in pretty much the exact same way. Look. Black Hills Information Security and Security Weekly will never call you uh, to sell you anything. I may call you to say thanks for attending a class or a webcast. I'm not going to call you and try to get you to buy something. Um, I did this whole entire test because I have a friend that's big into venture capitalism. And uh, he's like, man, you need to go out and get some VC capital. You need to get yourself a marketing and sales team, just a couple million dollars, and then just imagine how much you can grow. And you can find all kinds of different companies out there that get VC capital funding, and they have slick one sheets, and they have all these things. I'm not interested in that. Um, he said we need a sales team. I say he's wrong. I now have data. And I want to say thanks to everybody that responded because you helped me win a bet. Also, any webcast that we do for Security Weekly, if it is sponsored by somebody like Tenable, if it is sponsored like some, by somebody like Palo Alto, it's going to be clearly denoted on the registration link and in the email that it is sponsored by that company. Um, I want to make sure that that's always on the up and up because I do believe that there's a certain amount of trust between Security Weekly and our audience, and we want to make sure that it stays that way. Now, to the 1%, since 99% of you said no to us getting a sales team, to the 1%, you scare me. Um, no, I'm not going to call you. I'm not going to tell you what I'm wearing. I'm not going to cover myself in Alpo dog food. I'm not going to meet your dom. I mean, what the hell? And I'm not going to suck your toes. I, seriously, for those of you that said, please call me because I want to talk to you about and then insert any horrible thing after that, go to hell. You guys scare me to death. I hope I never meet you. Some of the things that I read will haunt me for the rest of my life. All right, that's the end. Uh, my email is john at Black Hills InfoSec. You guys have my number. Um, Security Weekly is our podcast, as most of you know. Uh, Secure, Paul Security Weekly every single Thursday. Uh, please check it out. And of course, Black Hills InfoSec. So thank you so much for hanging out. I'm now going to move on to the question portion. If you guys want to bail, bail. If you have a question, whew, boy, we got a lot of questions. All right, so... Uh, first one, will the slides be made public? Yes, they will be. And yes, Emily, I did misspell Baggett's name with two Gs. I should have had two Gs. Uh, will the stage encoder x86 countdown work on other payloads other than macros? Yes, it will. It will work uh, for other payloads, specifically in the meterpreter family of payloads. Question is, what about zero-day attacks? Uh, many times, what we were talking about today was bypassing AV. Zero days are a lot different. Um, zero days are where you exploit a vulnerability in a piece of software. A payload is what you put on the computer system. Today, we are talking predominantly about payloads. And also, when we're discussing zero days, please, please, please understand that the level of access the application has, the level of access you would have. So if you have a zero day in Internet Explorer, generally, you're going to have permissions of the user that's using Internet Explorer. If you have a zero day in something like a system level process or a root level process, you're going to get system or root level access. Uh, whitelisting is hard, but it's worth it. Thank you, Kevin. I agree. 
Um, where do you want the cease and desist letters sent to? Um, they need to be sent to Paul at securityweekly.com. Uh, Paul at securityweekly.com would be awesome. What's up with the stash? I've decided to stop shaving, I guess, um, is where that goes. Um, all right. Just don't use Trend Micro. I don't know about that. Uh, great point. Can I get a job? Take a resume. Shoot a resume in to John at BlackHillsInfosec.com. Okay. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, VC guy, can you send me some money? No, I'm not going to have him send you money. <laughs> My friend is watching. Too much Silicon Valley? Absolutely. Cold call sales sucks. Helix was destroyed by a marketing team. Chad, awesome point. Absolutely it was. Uh, it's a lot of times there's these things that are beautiful and wonderful in the world of computer security. And uh, they go away because of a sales team. Who sponsored this? Trend Micro? No, Trend Micro did not sponsor this. Um, this is just Black Hills Information Security. I have stalkers. Yes, that scares me as well. No one wants to suck my toes. Uh, the audio and the video will be recorded as well. Woo! All right, everybody, we need to get out of here. Um, a lot of these things are getting very personal as well. Um, so get out of here, everybody. Thank you so much for attending. You guys have a great day and be on the lookout for the next edition of Sacred Cow Tipping. Thanks again.